morning and welcome to our online service for the 31st of January. Like last week, we're working with a couple of themes in this morning's service. This Sunday is Candlemas, or if you prefer, the festival of the presentation of Christ at the temple. This is the Sunday when the church remembers Jesus being taken to the temple when he was just eight days old and meeting a couple of elderly prophets, Simeon and Anna. And that's going to be reflected in our liturgy this morning. And Candlemas is actually also the time when we should put our crib scenes away. I expect you've already done that, but I actually like to leave ours out until the beginning of Lent, so ours is still uh, sitting there in our hallway. It's also this Sunday the third in our mini-series on John's first letter, so that's going to be the theme we explore in our readings and in the talk that uh, David has prepared for us. But now, wherever we are and however we're viewing this service, let's just take a moment, moment to be still, to pause, and to allow us to become aware of God's presence with us. And let's say our opening responses. We come from scattered lives to meet with God. Let us recognise his presence with us. As God's people we are gathered, let us worship him together. And now, as I've said, our theme this morning is God is love. So maybe you've already guessed what our opening hymn is going to be. Love divine or love's excelling.
And now we pray the collect for the festival of the presentation. Almighty and ever-living God, clothed in majesty, whose beloved Son was this day presented in the temple in the substance of our flesh, grant that we may be presented to you with pure and clean hearts by your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who is alive and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and for ever. Amen. Now we come to our time of confession. Jesus said, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me shall never walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. Let us bring our sins into his light and confess them in penitence and faith. We pray together. God of mercy, we acknowledge that we are all sinners. We turn from the wrong that we have thought and said and done. We are mindful of all that we have failed to do. For the sake of Jesus who died for us, forgive us all that is past and help us to live each day in the light of Christ our Lord. Amen. And so may Almighty God, who sent his Son into the world to save sinners, bring us his pardon and his peace, now and for ever. Amen. So when Mary and Joseph took Jesus to the temple in Jerusalem, when he was just eight days old, he met an old man there called Simeon, who had been promised by God that he would not die before he saw the Messiah. The Holy Spirit had led him to the temple on this day and seeing Jesus, he took him in his arms and said, Now, Lord, you let your servant go in peace. Your word has been fulfilled. My own eyes have seen the salvation which you have prepared in the sight of every people, a light to reveal you to the nations and the glory of your people Israel. Those verses are known as the Song of Simeon, and no service on the festival of the presentation would be complete without them. But now, uh, before David speaks on the theme God is Love, let's listen to our readings by Jill and Roger. The first reading is taken from John chapter 13, verses 1 to 17. Jesus washes his disciples' feet. It was just before the Passover feast. Jesus knew that the time had come for him to leave this world and go to the Father. Having loved his own who were in the world, he now showed them the full extent of his love. The ex evening meal was being served and the devil had already prompted Judas Iscariot, son of Simon, to betray Jesus. Jesus knew that the Father had put all the things under his power and that he had come from God and was returning to God. So he got up from the meal, took off his outer clothing and wrapped a towel round his waist. After that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash his disciples' feet, drying them with the towel that was wrapped around him. He came to Simon Peter, who said to him, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? Jesus replied, You do not realise now what I am doing, but later you will understand. No, said Peter, you shall never wash my feet. Jesus answered, Unless I wash you, you have no part with me. Then Lord, Simon Peter replied, Not just my feet, but my hands and my head as well. Jesus answered, A person who has had a bath needs only to wash his feet. His whole body is clean. And you are clean, though not every one of you. For he knew who was going to betray him, and that was why he said, not everyone was clean. When he had finished washing their feet, he put on his clothes and returned to his place. Do you understand what I have done for you? he asked them. You call me teacher and Lord, and rightly so, for that is what I am. Now that I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also should wash one another's feet. I have set you an example that you should do as I have done for you. 
I tell you the truth, no servant is greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. Now that you know these things, you will be blessed if you do them. This is the word of the Lord. The second reading is from 1 John, chapter 4, beginning at verse 7. Dear friends, let us love one another, for love comes from God. Everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God, because God is love. This is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only Son into the world that we might live through him. This is love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his Son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Dear friends, since God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God. But if we love one another, God lives in us, and his love is made complete in us. We know that we live in him and he in us, because he has given us of his spirit. And we have seen and testified that the Father has sent his Son to be the Saviour of the world. If anyone acknowledges that Jesus is the Son of God, God lives in him and he in God, and so we know and rely on the love God has for us. God is love. Whoever lives in love lives in God and God in him. In this way, love is made complete among us, so that we will have confidence on the day of judgment, because in this world we are like him. There is no fear in love, but perfect love drives out fear, because fear has to do with punishment. The one who fears is not made perfect in love. We love because he first loved us. If anyone says, I love God, yet hates his brother, he is a liar. For anyone who does not love his brother, whom he has seen, cannot love God, whom he has not seen. And he has given us this command, whoever loves God must also love his brother. This is the word of the Lord. Good morning. We're looking today at the message at the heart of St John's first letter. God is love. But first, let's ask for God's help as we explore what this means for us today. Lord, unveil my eyes. Let me see you face to face. The knowledge of your love as you live in me. Lord, renew my mind as your will unfolds in my life, in living every day by the power of your love. Amen. When something terrible happens that causes people to suffer, frequently the question's asked, how can God allow such dreadful things to happen? We may begin to doubt God's love and it becomes harder to trust him. It's difficult to hold together the existence of suffering and pain with the idea of a loving God. When thinking things through, we usually start with what is known or given and from that premise we question what is unknown. Similarly, because the suffering is real and known, we tend to place the question mark over the loving nature of God. But if you ask the wrong question, you're likely to come up with the wrong answer. Try turning the question the other way round and starting where the Bible starts, with God is love, verses 8 and 16. That is the given premise. Then the question mark is placed over the suffering. What am I to make of this suffering and how can I turn it to advantage? John has just written, God is light and added, and in him is no darkness at all. This leads him to exclaim, God is love, and we can be sure of this, for God loved the world so much 
that he sent his one and only son who gave his life to rescue us from sin and death. God's nature is to love. His love for you and for me and for all creation is not conditional. It doesn't depend on the attractiveness or worthiness of the object for it to be exercised. Divine love is utterly different. It cannot be earned. It cannot be deserved. God loves because that is his nature. This 15th century icon represents the Holy Trinity, portraying God in relationship. Love flows between the three persons so that every activity expresses the dynamic of love. The Father loves the Son, the Son loves the Father, the Spirit loves the Son, and so on. It is not simply that God loves, but that he is love. As evidence of this, John focuses on two ways in which the love of God can be both seen and communicated. First, God's love is seen in the cross of Christ. This is how God showed his love among us, wrote John. He sent his one and only son into the world that we might live through him. This is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins verses 9 and 10. The extent of God's love is revealed in sending Jesus, his only son, into the world to be the sacrifice that would redeem us from sin and give life. Standing at the foot of the cross, gazing on the lengths to which God's love has gone for us, it's impossible for us not to sense the power and possibilities in that love. When I think about the cross, when I think of Jesus, I'm reminded of his love, love that never leaves me. Who am I that he should die, giving life so freely? When I think about the cross, help me to believe it. God confirmed the victory of the cross by raising Jesus to new life. This is the power that has changed the world and goes on changing it through the followers of Jesus. This brings us to the second point. God's love is seen in how Christians love one another. Verse, verse 11. Dear friends, since God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. Jerome, a scholar in the early church, records that when the aged Ed Apostle John became so weak that he could no longer preach, he used to be carried into the congregation at Ephesus. Little children, he would always say, love one another. And when he was asked why he so frequently repeated it, he responded, because it is the Lord's command, and if this is all you do, it is enough. This kind of love is not about feelings, it's about choice. We see it in our first reading, which showed Jesus' practical down-to-earth love in action. Having loved his own, he loved them to the end. And taking a towel, he washed the dirty feet of his friends, even of Judas, who was going to betray him. The power of this love is illustrated in this short video of Alex's story from the Alpha Course. My mum had MS, so she was really ill when I was growing up. I didn't really know life without her having MS. But besides that, my parents were like the best to me. They, were, they would do anything for me. But I wasn't the best kid. I am now, like now I'm the best. But, uh, before, when I was a teenager, I, I would just lie and I would be rubbish in school. 
I wouldn't be like the violent kid or it wouldn't be like obvious. Like some kids get into gangs and selling drugs. I, I was like way too smart. Like I just like causing trouble that you couldn't get caught for. And over a period of time, I started to realize how you could steal without getting caught. One day coming back from the, the cinema, I remember walking through the door and my parents were sat at the dinner table and was like, Alex, we need to talk to you. And basically what happened is like, I just stole the money from their bank account and they found out. And so I ran upstairs into my room. I just remember feeling like I hate myself. Not even like who had I become. No, it wasn't like that sort of moment. It was more, I'm rubbish. Like, I'm just a bad kid. And so I piled my entire room against my door. Like I got my bed, my drawers on my bed, everything, and then piled it up and then just sat at the other end of this barricade. It was silent for a bit and I, I was crying and I just, my dad comes up the stairs, he knocks on the door and I just don't say anything. And then he stops and he's like, okay, I'm gonna go. But he said this thing, which I'll never forget exactly what he said. He said, I need you to know that me and your mum love you. We're just confused because we don't know what we haven't done for you. And then he he just said, I would love it if you open the door because I really want to give you a hug right now. And then like a few years later, I don't know what I was thinking about, but I was just thinking about that moment. I realized like that's the, like one of the most real examples of who God is that I've ever seen in my life. Just, just sort of that begging to come and show mercy. My dad's just the best. No one has ever seen God. But if we love one another, God lives in us and his love is made complete in us. Verse 12. We don't really know who God is until we look at Jesus. And people don't really know who God is until they see him revealed in the life of Christians. Love is choosing to act in the other person's best interests. On this point, I would like to pay tribute to George Pullman. We're still in shock from his sudden death. George had this amazing capacity to put himself out for others. It sprang from a great desire to see someone flourish, to be their best self. George was an encourager. We thank the Lord for all he meant to us and pray for God's comfort for his family as they mourn. So now, to summarise God, John's message. God is love. That is his nature. He loves all he has made. The evidence for this is seen in Jesus and the infinite price he paid on the cross to redeem the world. God says, you are precious in my sight, and I love you. Isaiah 43. Nothing we do alters his love for us. But when we respond to his love, he alters us. We love because he first loved us. Verse 19. And he lives in us by his spirit so that others may see and know the God who is love. Does this sound a bit daunting? Well, his spirit helps us in our weakness, the very life of God planted in us to bear fruit for him. Whoever lives in love lives in God and God in them, verse 16. The message is simple. Let us love one another for love comes from God. Verse 7. And I conclude with this little video, which has been a help to us. <laughs>
And now let's proclaim our faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again, he ascended into heaven, he is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Let's begin our prayers by reflecting on God's wonderful love. Father, the Apostle John teaches that you are love. Father, thank you that you have such love for all the world, all that you have created, that you sent your one and only Son, Jesus, into the world to save us by his death on the cross from the consequences of our disobedience so that all who believe in him and the reality of what he's done for us will have everlasting life. Thank you that through his Holy Spirit, we have assurance and we can rely on your faithful, unchanging love. We praise you that by your Spirit, we can be united in love for each other. Help us to show this love in practical service in the church family and in our wider communities. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Now, Father, we thank you that we can come to you to bring those things that are on our hearts this morning for the world, our nation and our friends and families. 
we bring to you the global crisis created by the pandemic. We know that in some countries, in India, in Africa, South America, the infection rate is massive and their limited resources are overwhelmed. We pray for the peoples of those places, especially where poverty and overcrowding make them vulnerable. We pray for their governments, that they would do all they can to provide for all their peoples. But we know they may not have adequate resources and cannot do much. And so we pray, Lord, that you would act powerfully to save them. Would you inspire richer countries like ours to ensure that vaccines are shared fairly around the world and that no marginalised peoples are excluded from inoculations? We pray, Lord, that you would have your hand upon this important work. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Father, in our own lives, we have anxieties about the coronavirus as we understand more clearly how long this period of lockdown must, must be sustained. We do give you great thanks that we do now have a virus have vaccines for the determination and skill of the vaccine developers and all those now working long hours to ensure that everyone is vaccinated as quickly as possible. But we know that even so it will take a long time before many of us can resume active lives. We're all facing difficulties of different kinds and anxious thoughts about our own health and that of family and friends. For some, fears about our jobs, our schools, our pensions, and the state of the national economy. Jesus, you taught us to be anxious for nothing. And so we ask you to help us to roll all our fears onto you. Help us to do this again and again, as fears surface once more. Confident, that you want to hear us and bear our burdens for us. Help us to trust in you with all our hearts and not rely only on our own meagre resources. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Now we pray for those with COVID-19 and for the NHS almost at breaking point trying to look after them. Father, we know that there are about 35,000 people in hospital, very ill, many dying at this time. We pray for each one of them, frightened and isolated from their families. We ask that you would hear them, heal them, whatever state they're in, that you would grant them an awareness that you are very near to them, to comfort and give peace. We pray for the frontline NHS staff who have endured two waves of excessive workloads, surrounded by so many very sick and dying patients, and for many in some personal danger of catching this deadly virus. Lord, thank you for the altruism and dedication you have given them. Would you be their rock at this terrible time for each of them? Would many turn to you for your love and support as they do their work day after day, dealing with patients for whom they can do too little to help, talking with distressed relatives and just keeping going? Many will pray, Lord, for their patients and for themselves. Please would you encourage them with answered prayers. And we also want to pray for all those other essential workers in our communities, those who have kept essential shops open, the staff at the surgery, for all teachers providing e-learning and all parents homeschooling. Please would you protect them and be with them in these difficult times. 
Father, we especially want to pray for young people and for our elders. Schools and universities are again closed. Students are missing out of so much more than just formal education. Friends, interests, sports, even parties. We pray that you would guard them mentally, spiritually and physically. May this time of relative isolation do no lasting damage. And for our older people, we ask for your protection, speedy and effective vaccination and plenty of support from community and friends. During this time, when family and friends cannot give them the support they depend on, <clears throat> would they grow ever closer to you in this time of isolation? Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And now, Heavenly Father, we pray for all those who are in any kind of need, those who are unwell, waiting for surgery, or investigations that have been postponed. We pray for those we know isolated in care homes. We pray for all who are mourning the loss of a loved one. And we think particularly of Penny and her family. May they all know your peace and comfort. In a moment of quiet, we name the people on our hearts before you. We lift all these people to you, Lord, asking that they would know your comfort, trust in your power, and be aware that your everlasting arms are underneath them in all they are facing. Merciful Father, I accept all these prayers for the sake of your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. Together, we pray the prayer that Jesus taught us. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours, now and for ever. Amen. Our final hymn this morning is And Can It Be? The end of the first verse is very fitting for our theme of God is Love. It says, Amazing love, how can it be that you, my God, should die for me?
Christ, the Son of God, born of Mary, fill us with his grace to trust his promises and obey his will. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit be with us and remain with us always. Amen. We go in the light and peace of Christ. Thanks be to God. So we do hope that you've enjoyed this morning's service and will join us again next week. Next week, of course, will still only be an online service. We won't be able to start live services for at least a few weeks more. We'll be reviewing our decision on that in the next week or two. Our churches are open for personal prayer during the week at the times that will appear in the scrolling text at the end of this service and I expect you already know them by now. And just a reminder also that prayer ministry is as always on offer on a Sunday morning 10.45 to 11.30 and this week it's with Penny and Guy so do give them a call if, if you would like to be prayed for or if there's someone or something for which you would appreciate prayer. And if you do want to talk to somebody uh, about prayer any other time, then you're always very really welcome to give me a call. Just a reminder also that although Carolyn Cottage is not open for visitors at the moment, the phone lines uh, are still staffed uh, six mornings a week. So if you need any help from Carolyn Cottage volunteers, do give them a call. And it was, it was two weeks ago now that we did a little experiment with Zoom fellowship after uh, the slot of our, the time slot of our Sunday morning service and on the Sunday evening. That went pretty well, really. And those who were 
who took part in it very much enjoyed it. So we're going to do that again in a fortnight's time on the 14th of February and Holly and I will be sending out the details of that nearer the time. So I think that's all for this morning. So I do hope that you have a good week and in the meantime keep safe, keep well and keep in touch. God bless.